We are Honky Tonkin, and I can't tell you how happy I am. I've been trying to get you on this show for a long time. And I'm glad Mr. John Conley is here with us today. Thank you. So we're going to go back and play a lot of your old songs. And and uh, I'm just excited to chat with you and, and kind of hear you tell your story. And, All right. Because there's so much about you that I really don't know, man. So I'd just really like to get to know you a little we'll bit. We'll fill in some blanks. Absolutely. Yeah. So when did you come to Nashville? I came to Nashville in 1971, not for music. Yep. Music had been my hobby since I was a kid. But I came here because I got a job at WLAC Radio in 1971. And came to town to read news for four hours every morning uh, when when that station was news talk the first time. Yeah. And uh, after I'd been here a little while, I got to writing a little bit and so had spare time in the afternoon. So I pitched my songs around town and it finally resulted in an offer to record. And, uh, you know, the span of time from coming to town to having the first hit was seven years. Wow, you still got that radio voice too. Yeah, I mean, you yeah, do. I don't, you don't lose it. It's up, there. Probably. I didn't realize you started in radio. So yeah. I also heard years ago, and and so I'm, I'm sure it's true that you started off in the funeral home business. Are you? Yeah, I was raised on a farm uh, that I still have in Kentucky, but yeah. uh, uh, I I couldn't. I had allergies and all that, and uh, so I decided to find something else besides the farm as a career. Uh, I, I really. When I was a kid taking guitar lessons, I fell in love with radio at that time. And my original plan was to go straight into broadcasting out of out of school. Yeah. But I got sidelined. A good friend of mine was working at a local funeral home. He talked about it so much that it got me curious about it. And so I started working with him part time, got so interested in it that I said, oh, I'll, I'll do this for a while. So I got my licenses and did that for six years. Uh right out of high school and uh but i still had that old itch for broadcasting and so i uh i left the funeral home and uh, and got into radio i i had allergies too i was allergic to hauling hay <laughs> <laughs> yes because daddy made us do a lot of it. i know i, I know i think i was driving a tractor about as soon as i could walk <laughs> oh yeah started driving a tractor before any kind of four-wheeled regular vehicle uh so, so what kind of stuff did y'all do on the farm? You raise cattle or you grow crops or what'd you do? The answer is yes. We tried right. everything. The typical family farm. Uh, we always had cattle. We always had hogs. Uh, and tobacco was the cash crop in Kentucky where I'm from. Yeah. And, uh, and then on the side, of course, hay, uh, sometimes corn. Uh, you name it, we tried it. We raised sheep at one time and, uh, you know, all kind of, had chickens, had oh, a thousand yeah. hens. And I spent my Saturday, I spent every afternoon working a thousand eggs from those hens. Don't those eggs taste better than store eggs? Oh, oh yes, yes, they, they do. do. They do. And, but, and then spent Saturday morning selling them door to door. So uh, uh, brothers and sisters, how big was your One name? sister. Yeah. One sister who, lived, who moved to Nashville uh, before I did. And uh, she, got a, she was a school teacher. In fact, I brought her down here for her first interview. And she talked about Nashville so much that when I got ready to f try to find that new radio job, I started in Nashville. And uh, I picked up the phone. I, in those days, AM radio was still a horse for in mar markets. I tried WSM first, got a busy signal. Uh, the other 50,000 water was LAC. Called them, got through. They needed somebody, sent a tape, got hired. But I came to Nashville because, or tried to start there because my sister had been here for a year and loved the town. Yeah, that's great. So we're going to play a whole bunch of your songs today. Going to start off with a big number one hit from all the way back in 1978, Lady, Lady Lay Down. I guess this was one of your, was this your first one? No, this was a follow-up to Rose Colored Glasses. Got you. We got to wait on that one. Yeah, okay. Well, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Rose was the first one that hit the charts and kept going up the charts. But it was my fourth release. I had three others before uh, Rose that didn't work. Yeah. Oddly enough, the very first one was Backside of 30, and we can talk about that whenever you want to. Yeah. But uh, Here's John Conley and Lady Lay Down. We're honky-tonking in the studio with my friend John Conley. Pat O. Yeah, uh, John, I, I, Tracy may not remember this, but a few years ago we had Ronnie McDowell in the studio. Right. And he told us a story that when you, before you had become a famous country singer, you right. were still working at WLAC, and you broke his first record. Yeah, I was the music director at that time when Elvis passed away and Ronnie went to the studio and cut A King Is Gone. Mm -hmm. And I remember him walking through the door with this record in hand. He had cut it basically the night before. And he had a test pressing of it already. And uh, WLAC was the first rock and roll radio station. At that time, it was rock by then. 
And we were the first rock and roll radio station to play it in the country uh, that day. Wow. So, yeah, that's when we first met. And I that's, remember that's, it well. Uh, that's a combination of being in the right place at the right time for oh, yeah. both of you. I mean, because that song it ended up being a massive hit. Oh, absolutely. And he cut it in the same studio I was using at the time, uh, Music City Recorders. Because yeah, this, this had to be very close to when you were right before you released Rose Colored Glasses. Yeah, so it was in, that was 77, I believe, was the year for that. And, uh, yeah, it 78's when Rose hit, uh, May of 78. So I was there a few more months. Mr. Ronnie McDowell, the king is gone. In the studio, Mr. John Conley. Boy, radio's changed a lot, all this automation. Back, uh, remember when uh, uh, you had to back the needle up on the groove? Oh, yeah. All the, I mean, uh, all the things back then. I, uh, was, I was a mass comm major in college, so I, I had to work at the campus radio station. So oh, so you're I familiar. Little, yeah. I got a little bit of it. <laughs> I, I, loved the, I, lo I fell in love with the tech, uh, technology of it uh, in those days. I loved watching the disc jockeys queuing up records and uh, pulling carts and, you know, uh, the whole thing. The old pot boards, and I've got a, an old Gates board in my home office oh, at, at awesome. home with turntables and cart machines and really? the whole bit, uh, just to play, just that's to play. That's awesome. Yeah, I love you it. You know, there there was such an art to it back then. I, you know, I remember what, I loved to watch guys come in that really, you know, be talking while they're setting the stuff up and oh, running yeah. a commercial spot. I mean, you had to multitask. I mean, there was really a craft to it. Oh, yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, Not to mention back timing, like when you had to hit the news <laughs> at the top of the hour. And yeah. You had to talk. You know, and count backwards in your head and make sure you hit it, you know, right at that moment. Right at that or moment. Or hit the post of the records without being able to go in afterwards and, like, shift. No, you oh, had to yeah. do it live. You yeah. had to do it all you know? live. I mean, it was an amazing. There was definitely a skill to it. Absolutely. And the really good ones really stuck out. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was an amazing thing. You're right. So at what age did you really realize that you had a good voice? When did when did, when did oh, you I wake up to it? I just knew that I loved singing. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's what I knew. And I love music. The first thing I was attracted to Back again, back in the day when on television there were a lot of variety shows, Ed Sullivan and and all the others, when music would come on, I would stand in front of the TV and pretend I was directing it when I was a small child. Really, and to the to the point that my folks finally found somewhere a little baby baton that they got me so I could trade my pencil in for that baton, and uh, I just I just loved it. So I would be doing. I mean, it would still be my hobby had it never turned into a career. I, I, because I, I just love doing it. I'm supposed to do it. I, I understand that. And I think most people that really look at it as being a lifestyle and a, and a lifelong career, right. there's, there, you never stop. It, it is. It's just no, in no. you. It's, exactly. it's, part of, it's part of your DNA makeup. Uh, did you have musicians in your family? Did you have it in your background? I mean, well, you know. not uh, professionally. My, I, my grandmother played piano. My mother played piano a little bit. But they just noodled around on it. They, yeah. didn't, they could read music and they could play out of the hymn book mostly. But uh, they didn't do a lot of it. And uh, my dad, it turns out, uh, you know, I could have been on the Grand Ole Opry much sooner if he had just uh, taken up an invitation that he got from the Opry years ago. He, he had a little square dance group in Lexington uh, nearby, and they won a contest at a fair. And somebody from the Opry was around, I guess, and invited him to come to the Opry and do a call a square dance. Oh, yeah. And But he, he said, I'll, I'll do it. But I got to bring my group, and they wouldn't let him bring the group, so he didn't do it. And uh, so I, I've always said I'm, I might have been there a lot sooner. <laughs> Were you in yes. the group? Is no, that, I, no, no, I wasn't here yet. <laughs> you just you just found your way there. I wasn't even in his mind at all. He wasn't married, you know. It was when he was still honky tonking. Oh, <laughs> yeah. right. So did you ever take up the square dance and were you a dancer? No, 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 no. no. no I, and I never heard him call one. I wish I had him. <laughs> that, that's always been pretty interesting. I, I love uh, I love a lot of your songs. You did a really great job. I don't know if, if you were really hands on and picking a lot of these songs over the yeah, years, but your body of work is really tremendous. And uh, your style, I mean, I, I, I just you have such a great voice. Did you, did you develop it? Did somebody kind of hone that in for you? I mean, it's just, or was it just totally natural? It, it, it just evolved over time. And I credit my time in broadcasting for uh, being responsible a lot for the way I sing, yeah. using my voice to speak all that time for nine years altogether in radio. Changed the way I, I would sing. Uh, before radio, I had a softer folk type sound. In fact, we had a folk group when I was in high school during the uh, hootenanny days of Kingston Trio and Brothers Four and Peter, Paul, and Mary, and we did a lot of folk music. But after the time in broadcasting and working part of the time with people like John R. John R. way down south. And <laughs> Hoss Allen. 
you know, these yeah. guys. I mean, that influenced. Uh, plus, I love R and B. I've listened to more R and B than any than any other kind of music, really. Yeah. Uh, even more than country, and uh, all of that came together to be responsible for how I sound. So, backside of thirty, it was a number one record back in nineteen seventy nine. Uh, Where did you, you find you it? You released this. You you mentioned earlier that this was a song that you had put out and didn't. Backside of 30 yeah. was the one. It was the very first release, and it was a hit in about a half a dozen towns, uh, cities, Louisville, Kentucky being one of the biggest. And, in fact, they had a, a problem because it was single number one and single number six. And when it was re-released as single number six, they didn't know what to do. They, they, it was an oldie to them. They'd already had a hit. They'd already it. had a hit. It was an oldie to them, but they played mm-hmm. it again anyway. Yeah. Yeah, radio chart system have definitely changed a lot since then. Yeah. Now, now radio jocks don't have the ability to play those new records. It's all got to be programmed from upstairs. I know. That's kind of frustrating. I, by uh, it's it. terrible. All right. Taking you back. Big old hit from John Conley. Here's Backside of 30. Gatlin Brothers, Houston. In studio, Mr. John Conley. You know, I... Uh, that body of work, man. Uh, all those songs that you had, it was that had to be a great time. When uh, what was it like? You remember when the first song came out when it started going up the charts? You really knew that it like when Rose Colored Glasses. Did you feel that impact of that? Yeah, R- Rose Colored Glasses. I knew we had a hit, or felt like we did. When I was I was driving from Nashville to the farm in Kentucky late one night and tuning across the dial. Uh, Rose was out, and uh, but I tuned to Chicago and heard it off of a station in, out of Chicago. As soon as it finished, I tuned over to WBAP in Fort Worth, and it wasn't too long. They played it there, and that's when I knew we or felt like we had a hit. And I didn't leave the radio job. Uh, Rose came out in May. I didn't leave the station until the fall of 78. So I, I let her cook on the, on the charts to make sure it looked like it was going to keep going. So when you first started touring, uh, who did you tour with out of the box when you went out and really started working off those hits? Well, I worked by myself. I've worked by myself almost exclusively really? the, my whole career. I haven't. The, the closest I've come to doing a tour with somebody would be Conway Twitty. We did a number of Conway's dates, not all in a row, but a lot of them during the course of two or three years. Uh, th- that's the only artist that uh, that I've worked the most with uh, back in the day. Yeah, Really? Yeah. I did a lot of club stuff and and uh, just single dates, you know. Wow, that's amazing! I really figured you'd have been out working with a lot of a lot of the big acts, man. You had such a hot run, man. The late yeah, 70s. well, I I don't know why that didn't work that way, but it, that that's the way it worked. What label were you on back then? I uh, started out on ABC, which merged then to MCA. Okay. And uh, but I got to work with the same people. Jim Fogelsong is who signed me to ABC. Yeah. But when it became MCA, he was still heading that label, that arm of it at that time. And uh, I'm thankful. I'm so blessed to, you mentioned the body of work, and I I did approve a lot of the songs, uh, all of the songs, actually. But my producer, Bud Logan, uh, he was in town all of the time when I was on the road so much, and he, he was the first person to hear these songs. And hang he hung out with all the tree guys, all the, the the Red Lanes and Harlan Howards and all those folks, and uh, he was the source of finding a lot of these great songs. You know, to me, a lot of the stuff that was going on, I mean, like the Ray Price stuff, the the, the big band stuff, you know, the quartet background vocals and all that stuff. You seemed like your production was a little bit ahead of its time. It seemed to have the weaving structure and things in it mm-hmm. uh, without the stacked acoustic guitars and all that. It was it was very structured and very thought out. I always appreciated the structure of those well, songs. Well, thank you very much. We, we just tried to do the best, uh, whatever the song needed. And uh, that that's the same with the type of songs we we put out. Whenever we'd say, okay, we're getting ready to record, the first question you always get from writers and publishers is, what are you looking for? Well, I'm looking for the greatest song you got in your pocket. Absolutely. That's what I'm looking for. I don't for. want you see drawer stuff. Uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> and I don't want I don't want to you know limit it by saying we want to talk about this or that or the other thing. Uh, so we that's all we were ever looking for, and I think it paid off. Another big hit by John Conley. Wait, now this one, Tracy, I've got to take oh, out. Did, uh, this, this is one that you pulled off vinyl. We've got a bunch of these that we're going to play off of vinyl. Oh, okay. So we've got, this is your second record. Second record. Forever album. The Forever album. Yes. And if, if, you, go to, if you go online and you look up the cover uh, of Forever and it comes up in a picture, you will notice that I'm wearing a heavy, heavy winter coat. <laughs> they decided that it would be a great idea for us to fly to California, go up in the heat of the mountains where, you know, and and put on, this is not just a winter coat. This is a, a coat 
that you could use in Alaska <laughs> in the dead of winter. And the lady, <laughs> they had to stand to the side of me and fan the gnats off of me in order to take this picture. Think about how much of that is insane. First of all, the, the, yeah. the, the, wearing the winter coat, and, but why did you have to fly to California That's, to I take a picture? That. I want to know that, that picture. Anywhere in Nashville. Exactly. You can't see anything behind you. No, it's just a sunset. We got them here. I'll, I'll also <laughs> say that here's a, here's a 1979 thing that would never happen today. Flip that over, and he's smoking a cigarette on the oh, back. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We were talking just off the air about, I, I can't think of an artist on the chart right now whose label would let him put a picture of him smoking a cigarette no on the No way. Not yeah. a chance. Right. There's not any way right. at all. Well, uh, again, I'm so thankful I got to do it when I got to do yeah. it. <laughs> Here's yeah. before my time. That's right. <laughs> my buddy John Anderson. Got to love that voice, man. Nobody like him. Oh, I know. I love old John. So tell me about these blues influences. Who are the people that you listen to? All-time favorite artist is Ray Charles. Gotcha. Uh, he could yeah. sing the phone book and sell it. Yeah. Um, and uh, of all the artists I ever got to work with, we got to I got to do a show with him in Samstown in Las Vegas years and uh, years ago. And that was a thrill. I'd, I'd seen his show when he'd been in Nashville two or three times and had met him uh, briefly. But when when he came out backstage before the show started, he came out and, and uh, I Don't Remember Loving You was a hit on the charts for me at that time. And he came out, took my hand, and started singing uh, I Don't Remember Loving You to me. Now, he, they may have fed him the line but just before he walked out the door. I don't know, and I don't care. But, <laughs> but I know he was a true country music fan. Yeah, he, he, was, he yeah. loved country music, and I, I, I would have to believe that he knew pretty much what everybody did. He someone, was, yeah, yeah. someone a couple of years ago said they knew that he did like that song. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, that was good. <laughs> so who are the guys, I mean, uh, who were your peers that you looked up to or that you appreciated? I mean, as far as country artists, was there anybody you looked up to as you were cutting your teeth early on? Or, I mean, Well, was, when I when I I was working at LAC uh, on the way into work in the morning. I'd listen to the country station going into work at LAC because we were news talk again when yep. I started later rock and roll, never country uh, uh, as a format. And uh, so I'd listen to the country people. I, I loved Ronnie Millsap. Some of the stuff he was doing back in the seventies. Oh yeah. Just knocked me out. And of course, Merle Haggard and George Jones, uh, lefty, all the soul singers, yep. uh, no matter the format, I, I got to have the soul singers, and it's also Frank Sinatra and Tony Bennett. I know? agree totally, yeah. absolutely. Right. And the baritone singers, the guys with that resonance, with right. all the, the the good chops and everything. Tennessee Ernie Ford. I, I, I of all the people I never got to meet, I wish I could have met Tennessee Ernie. I just I also loved a radio uh, DJ. Oh yeah, absolutely. Who, who became a country music uh, hall of famer? So, In yeah. fact, yeah, he was on the air. Uh, I understand when Pearl Harbor happened. Uh, oh, I didn't even. Yeah, know that. over in East Tennessee, he he announced it. In uh, Bristol, over there where he lived. Yeah. Wow. All right, we're going to go to 1980. This was a big top ten hit called Baby, You're Something. Tell me about this song. Uh, same people that wrote Lady Lay Down wrote Baby, You're Something. And uh, Ray Van Hoy and Don Cook. And uh, just one of those special feeling songs. You know, they did a great job. We did several of their songs back in the day. And uh, this one was a big record for us. Here's John Conley, Baby, You're Something. Randy Travis. In the studio with John Conley, having a good conversation. I love this. Good getting to know you a little bit. Well, thank you. I, I enjoy it, too. We've uh, we've had the opportunity to share the stage at the Opry a whole lot. When were you inducted into the Grand Ole Opry? 1981. February 7th of 81 is when I became a member. Yeah. Wow. And you've been, how, how often do you perform there still? Basically, if I'm not on the road, I'm available out there. And uh, the way it seems to work out is I do at least once or twice a week when I'm home. Yeah. yeah. Do you uh, do you still do a lot of work, road work? Are you still out on the road? Much? Yeah, we still do sixty about 60 shows a year on the awesome. road, the way it's, you know, pandemic excluded. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, we'll hit close to that this year. Yeah. Uh, f festivals or theaters, what kind of stuff? A little you bit of everything. Yeah. A, a lot of smaller theaters, which I love because it's more intimate and yeah. I can talk to folks and – uh, kind of be more one-on-one -on -one with people. So uh, we do a few fairs, but, uh, you know, I don't mind not being out in the heat of the summer. Oh, <laughs> tell me about <laughs> it. On an outside oh. stage, swatting Ooh. gnats and Oh, mosquitoes. just melting, sweating, sweating oh, yeah. through your clothes. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to test you a little bit. So uh, any, do you listen to the radio much anymore? Is there any New other? country, no. Really? Never. Don't like it at all? No, uh, no. I, there's there's a song here and there that interests me, but it's I can't plow through all the... the uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> crap so to get to the little good one you know so what what was the cutoff point for you when when did it start to get to that place for you not by the time i came out no no 
<laughs> no. That's it. He heard that Tracy no. Lawrence. I'm like, that's it. No. I don't dead. remember what the year was. I don't remember what the years were, but whenever they stopped putting Merle Haggard with a new song on the radio, whenever that started, I understand. That was about the time. From that point forward, it's been downhill since then, in my opinion. It's changed a lot, and it seems about every 10 years it gets a little bit more convoluted. Yeah. Uh, and it's a, it's a struggle. Uh, I, I think I think traditional country is trying to make a comeback out there. But yeah, I, and, I, and I hope it does. I hope I hope that, the, that, you know, that we end up with some more distinctive voices uh, on, on the air. There's no reason why. But, but it's because the industry doesn't hold out for that. They don't want that. They don't want that. No, no they, they don't want it. And uh, and also song quality. Uh, you know, I don't know if old school would be a hit today. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, that's a shame, but I don't know if it could be. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if it would either. Yeah. Uh, just uh, I, I don't know. And, and people's attention span has kind of changed, too. It's yeah. like you, uh, you got to get in and get out. If you don't get to that course real quick, you can't really even set up a song much anymore. Yeah, I know. But uh, it's, it's just a different time and place. Do you do any social media at all? A f- little bit of Facebook. My yeah. daughter runs that for me, yeah. but and, but uh, no Twitter, n- none of the other stuff. I'm yeah. I'm I- I'm not for any of that stuff, uh, <laughs> and I'm not really I'm not a giant Facebook fan based on some of the policies they do. I'm a uh, conservative Christian. I understand, and uh, they they go against my religion in a lot of ways, and uh, I don't like that. But we do have a presence because I know some people like it, and they. Keep up with us that way. And, and that's we do we live do. in a country where we have the ability to, to be who yeah. we want to be. That's right. But I, I lean more in your direction, too, and I think most of our audience out there yeah. does, too. Right. And uh, I, I enjoy that, that being at that place in life where we can do what we want to do. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, the thing, I, I haven't, uh, I don't know if, when I'll ever do another country thing. I'm doing gospel more than anything really? right now. Yeah. I've got a new gospel project that we're about to finish up. Uh, it, we hope to have it out before 2022 ends. Uh, yeah. But... Uh, but I'm leaning that direction. That's what where I, what I listen to most. It's what I do at church. And but there's I love the music. That's first of all. But secondly, we need the message out of the hymn books and some of the classic sounding songs. And and we're doing this that the same way we did country, looking for the best songs we can find that have a distinctive melody, a distinctive message. They don't repeat one line forty nine times. Well, that's you know. different than most of the progressive Christian music. Oh, I know. I, I can't. I don't. I don't yeah. like that either. So, anyway, I'm sure that's it's soulful. Yeah, that, that's the direction I'm going right now because I think the the world needs the message. Amen. So let's go back. This is probably one of my personal favorites of all the stuff you did. Big number one record in 1980 called Friday Night Blues. Oh yeah. Where'd you find this one? Sonny Throckmorton. Oh, what Sonny a big writer he was. Oh yeah, it still is. He's still holding forth. And uh, last I knew, he moved back to Brownwood, Texas, his hometown. Oh, still writing. This thing right here would be a hit again today, I believe. I think I, you're I, right. I, I think the lyric do, is strong enough. Yeah. Do you know who played the piano? On that record, on was, the, it, was it Pig? Because it doesn't no, it sound like Pig, Pig no, Robbins. It okay. wasn't Pig. No, yeah, I, unfortunately, I never. But was it Bud Logan that came up with the arrangement, or was it Sonny's demo pretty close to that with the piano and all the guitar licks? Uh, it's and... been a long time since I heard the demo, <laughs> but <laughs> but <laughs> it's pretty close. I'd it's say. pretty close. Okay. Yeah, I'd say, and it, I'm not sure who played piano. To, uh, it could have been Ron Oates. It could have been uh, Dennis Burnside. Could have been a couple of different people. Big old record from John Conley. Here's Friday Night Blues. A little pause for the calls. So, John, uh, you probably hadn't heard of this, but you remember uh, when you were playing in club bands and everything, when they'd set a, a basket or a pickle jar or something down on the stage and right. people would tip you for a song? Sure. Well, they've got an app for it now. It's called PickleJar.com. If you love music, you need to download the Pickle Jar app. Show gratitude to your favorite artists and support great causes in your hometown. Plus, you can watch exclusive content you can't find anywhere else. Download at PickleJar.com. Tell me about it, Patrick. PickleJar.com. Listen, <laughs> you can not only can you help out and tip bands and artists, but they got all kind of exclusive stuff and they're going flyaways and cool contests and pictures and videos that you can only get there. It's They're really trying to create like a social media app for music. And I oh, believe 100% fans. of it goes to the artist. 100% of what you give goes to the artist. Cool. That's great. Go. Wish we'd have had it in 1980. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl Singletary. What a big record that was. So you had four number one records in a row in 1983. Mm-hmm. And uh, that kind of uh, set you up, didn't it? That was pretty much uh, the, the place that kind of got you where you wanted to be. Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, when I started doing this, I had two goals. One is to have longevity, to, to be able to do it as long as I wanted to do it. Yep. 
and uh, the second was to produce a body of work. And we've we've done both of those things, thank the Lord. Uh, but yeah, eighty three was sort of clinched the deal in, in a way and uh, set us up to to keep going on beyond that. You know, we were talking a little bit uh, off mic uh, just about the state of country music and where a lot of things are. You know, back then, uh, even in the nineties, we were we were getting four singles a year off an album. We were cutting like an album every year and a half or so. So we were able to build up a body of work. In right. about 10 years, you had, a, you had a body of work that you could live off of the rest of your life. Right. Now these, I, I know singles that have been on the charts for 60-something weeks. Yeah. That, that, you know, these kids come out there and the label takes so much of everything that they have. Right. They might get five singles in 10 years. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. they're not able to build a catalog where they're able to work. Right. How was the chart system back then? You know, I think right now you're getting about 17 or 18 currents. I know this is muso stuff over everybody's head, but, but I, I like to understand the structure and how things were. Because it's all changed over the years, like every decade it evolves. So in the 70s and 80s, how was the radio chart system? Well, the, the radio chart system basically, and uh, I point this out in shows all the time. I, I, sometimes I introduce uh, my first number one record, which was Lady Lay Down, not Rose Colored Glasses. And that throws people. They think Rose was the first number. Well, Rose was never number one. Yeah. Seven is as high as it got on the charts. And the reason it broke in Houston, it it covered that region, and then bicycled to the next region, whichever one it was, and it bicycled its way around the country. To have a number one record on the charts in those days, you had to have all the stations take it up their individual charts at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, uh, and that didn't happen with Rose Colored Glasses. But I always follow it by saying, if every song could be a standard in music like it is and become as popular as it ha has become, and be be my signature song. I take seven every single time. Absolutely, the numbers don't matter. Is what it comes to. Uh, we talk about them all the time, but the numbers don't really have a, a lot of meaning. You know. So I wonder how many how many song, current songs were on the chart back then, and it was just Billboard. That was even before R and R came out, wasn't it? Yeah. It, it well, was, yeah. And and uh, of course, on the main chart, the Hot 100 uh, in Billboard. Uh, I believe the uh, the country chart was probably seventy five, if I'm not mistaken, May maybe a hundred. But uh, you know, wow, yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot, yeah. Now, it was a different day, a different world. Very much different. How many promotion people did you have working on your records at any one time? Was well, there four all or five? The, yeah, all the labels had regional promotion yeah, people. Pretty much the same way they do now. Yeah, I, and I don't even know what they're doing now, you know, yeah. and I'm not sure they do. <laughs> but I don't know. What, there I, aren't I, as many regions now as there used to be. Uh, they typically exactly. have four or five. Yeah. That's kind of how the country's broken down with one national over the top. Yeah. That's kind of the way that right. they run things. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's still very different today. I mean, it, even I remember... Uh, uh, so, for example, you put an album out and it gets in the record stores. So the 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 sales rep from Hastings or Anderson or whatever the distribu distributor was back then would come in, right? And every two weeks, and if the album wasn't in there, that order the album. Then it was two weeks before they came back to restock it. Yeah. So, so you're losing so much now. Everything's just so freaking. Yeah. Instant. You know, everything changed whenever the the barcode came into play uh, to to track sales. That's when the whole world of music changed that that time, and that happened at about the time Garth started. Mm -hmm. He was one of the first artists to to, uh, to to be able to capitalize on actual sales according to the barcode, as opposed to somebody picking up a phone and saying, what'd you sell this week? And they report it over the phone. That's the way it was before. Yeah, yeah. and the guy at the record store wasn't usually a country music fan. No, the exactly. The guy at the record store in a big city especially was like, ah, we sold the Beatles, and we sold <laughs> right. the Stones, and that's <laughs> yeah. it. You know, they, they didn't keep track that much of didn't, what... Didn't, and didn't care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, they didn't care. Yeah. So back in 1983, was this the first of those four number one records, Common Man? Was it the first? Uh, probably so. Yeah. I'm not sure of the time frame. It was. Frame. I'm, I'm <laughs> trusting okay. Patrick to lay this right. thing yes, out right. Yes, this was it. So Common Man, uh, did this? Did you draw this from your childhood? Did you ever write any of your stuff? Did you? Find I wrote Rose Colored Glasses along with a friend of mine yeah. and Backside of Thirty. Those are the only two singles that I had a hand in writing. Gotcha. Everything else with the full time guys. Sammy Johns wrote Common Man, and Sammy had a hit of his own as a pop artist in 1974 that I played on the radio called yeah. Chevy Van. And so it's obvious from Chevy Van, and he, he mentioned Chevy and Common Man as well. He liked Chevy, evidently. If I could have found a way to put Ford in there, I, it <laughs> wouldn't meet her out, so I had to leave it alone. I think you still drive a Ford to this day. <laughs> I do, you? absolutely. Yes, Here's John Conley, a big old record called Common Man. The Good Die Young, all the way back to 1993. Studio of Mr. John Conley, talking stories. Uh, funny road stories. Give me something good from back in the day. Mm, uh, I'm going to take you back. Come on, think of something good. Well, I uh, my first bus I bought new. It was a 1980 Eagle. 
uh, we had been on the road with it just a very short time, a matter of a few months. And we, we parked it uh, in some parking lot to go to a store, I think we were doing. And a lady parked across from us and evidently didn't put her car in park or set the brake or whatever. And she got out of the car and her car started rolling toward my brand new bus. <laughs> Several of us jumped out of the bus and were able to stop the car oh before it hit. <laughs> How many of you did it take to stop the car? Oh, it took a couple, three of us, but we, we managed to keep it from hitting us. So oh. did you, were you able to avoid the uh, station wagon and the van time, and did it actually kind of start it out yeah, in the bus? Yeah, I started the first year and a half. I flew everywhere with just a guitar player, and uh, and we'd lead a local, whatever local group they'd set up for us. Oh, yeah. Many, and met, what a nightmare that was uh, sometimes. So, sometimes they were not country-oriented bands. They didn't know any, you know, it, the first couple of records, I've got one hit, Rose Colored Glasses, and then later, uh, Lady Lay Down. They, But they didn't even know Hank Williams, and I was filling the rest of the set I was doing with old standards from... Hank and Merle and different people. Yeah. And you'd pull up at a place and the band, you'd, you'd say, okay, do you know uh, your cheating heart? No, we never heard of that. What's that? You, you knew you were in trouble for the night when that when that took place. Oh, my gosh. I can't imagine. I, I've never, uh, that, that's that's old school stuff right that there. That is, yeah. yeah. I didn't want to, i tell you, uh, I've always sort of been conservative about, I didn't want to, you know, get on the, on the string for a lot of uh, debt and all that stuff until it looked like we were going to, Keep going. And coming from radio, I knew that there were a lot of acts that had one or two hits and then evaporated. Yeah. And so I wanted to, about the third hit, I said, well, looks like we got a shot here. So then I, I bought the bus and hired the band. So what kind of band are you carrying now? What's what's the arrangement? Well, there uh, we've got uh, guitar, drums, bass, and keyboards, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that's it. And I don't play. I don't, you know, I play guitar around the house or I used to. My, my, Arthritic fingers are keeping me from doing much of that uh, now, but uh, that's it, and uh, and I concentrate on singing. Well, that's about all you need. That's with a voice like that. <laughs> here's another big old hit from John Conley. I'm only in it for the love. John Conley, only in it for the love. Okay, now wait a minute. Look at this, Tracy. Uh oh. This this says this song was written by uh, Barbara Wyrick. No, no, no. Uh, I'm only in it for the love. Oh. Was written by Ray Fanoy, yeah. who wrote a bunch of your songs. Correct. But he wrote it with Deborah Allen, who right. later on became a, a country artist, mm -hmm. and Kix Brooks. Yep. Really? 1983. Pre, pre Brooks and Dunn. Yeah, long uh, before Brooks and Dunn. The, here's the story that they told me about this. Uh, Rafe and Deborah went out to buy a new piano. And when they came home, sitting on their steps, waiting for them to return home, was Kix Brooks. They, the three of them took the new piano in the house, unpacked it, and set it up and started noodling around, and In It For The Love was born from that noodling session that they did. That's wow. what they tell me. Yeah, so. they say, I guess Kix was a songwriter, established songwriter yeah. in town for a but while. I know he moved, him and Brooks and Dunn. At least as far as I know, he moved to town in like 1983, so this must have been one of the very first songs I guess he wrote. so, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, this, the next song we're going to play is also on this album, and like you said, Barbara Wyrick wrote In My Eyes. Right. She was at, at the time a background singer with uh, with Ronnie Millsap, I believe. It was her full-time thing. But she wrote this song, and it... It just hit me right in the heart. It it explains things the way I feel about my wife, and so I dedicated it to my wife Gail, on the album, and it's the title cut from that album, the I In My Eyes album. I don't think we need to say anything more. There you go. Here's John Conley in my eyes. <laughs> don't you miss it? You're playing John songs Conley. off of the record player. Oh, <laughs> yes. yes. So how long have you been married to your wife? Just past the forty-year mark. You know how amazing that is in this business. Oh, I, in, in any business, or yeah. you know, in, in anywhere in our world. But yeah, I'm I'm blessed. Uh, she's yes, lady. the world just seems to be moving faster and faster. It does, it? yeah, and spinning a little bit out of control. I know uh, you've exp you've uh, said your your personal beliefs. I, I'm I'm concerned about a lot of things I see in the world. Oh, we yeah. don't talk a lot of politics on this show, but I know that you have pretty strong convictions about what you see and and how you feel about what's and going on. And a lot in the world. of it is just. Uh, a lack of common sense. We, we're doing is the the world is doing things that are 180 degrees away from just common sense, let alone uh, religious or anything else. There's no common sense to a lot of the stuff we do. I agree. And uh, it, we'll pay the price. It, it won't work. It never has. Well, you know, it says in the Bible that uh, right will be wrong and wrong will be right. That's right. We're, and I think we're living in those. We're days. we're right there. We you are bet. For sure. Honky Tonkin in the studio with John Conley. So what what kind of stuff do you do when you're not on the road? What's your what's your outlet? 
Well, I we mentioned a minute ago off off mic. Basically, I just did a brake job on my old pickup truck. Oh, you did it yourself? <laughs> I did it myself. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh wow. I uh, for a long time I did all the maintenance literally on my bus, and I spent part of yesterday getting ready for the trip we're about to leave on. Uh, I need I need you out the house. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, do you do do you work on other people's yeah. cars, John? <laughs> no, I don't even do as much on my own anymore. But for a long time, I did all the greasing and oil changing and a lot of the repairs. I grew up on a farm where my dad did a lot of custom work for the neighboring farmers, filling silos, combining, uh, baling hay, doing all the stuff for ourselves yeah. and them. And you you grow up working on machinery, and you got to keep your own stuff going uh, in the in that uh, that time frame. So I've I've kept doing that uh, all through my career. Uh, I keep the bus at my house. I've got a little shop there that uh, where I can work on it. I don't do as much as I used to. I've got a guy that comes to yeah. me. And uh, for a long time, had a driver who was a, one of the ace mechanics in town. And so, but I was right in there beside him pitching in whenever something major was going on to fix. So do you still listen to music around the house? Do you yeah. have a record player? And- yeah, well, yeah, yeah, all of that. Uh, I listen probably more in the car than anywhere else. Yeah. And, and on the bus, uh, MP3 player and that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It just seems like everything's moving so fast. It's gotten completely out of control the further we go down the road, man. Oh, I, true. I, you know, I remember when we first started touring, uh, before satellite dishes were on the bus, Yeah, right. when everybody was just listening to music all the time. Yeah. And, and we barely listen to music that much anymore. No, just, and we don't, um, I, you know, I, I cram uh, old Perry Masons and Andy Griffiths and all that uh, down the rest of the guys. Fortunately, yeah. we're all older, so they, they relate to it too, but... Uh, I like the classic TV as well. Yeah. Uh, oh, know. westerns and stuff? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So what did you uh, do through COVID? How did you adjust to the COVID? I refuse to be fearful of it. Amen. But you seem like you're in great health. I'm you in got, great health. You do great, man. And I, and I said when it first started, I said, people said, well, what if you get it and it kills you? I'll be with Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, brother. Here's the last one of those big four number one records you had in a row. This one landed there in 1984. As long as I'm rocking with you, here's John Conley. That ain't country. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell him. <laughs> oh, we're honky talking with Mr. John Conley. Th- this song right here, you know, uh, they always say, you know, that one marquee song, if you have that one song, it That's makes right. an entire career, and we know that about Charlie Daniels and a lot of the icons that we've had. This was probably yours. Oh, it, absolutely. Yeah. It is mine. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm, I, I never realized that you wrote this, but I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I wrote uh, – I was – the, the idea came to me because I was in a relationship that wasn't working out at the time, never did work out. But then, of course, if it had, I wouldn't have the wife and family that I have now. Yeah. So it wasn't supposed to work out. But at any rate um, – it started out as love colored glasses when I started writing it. I later thought of the old catchphrase rose colored and changed the wording. But I wrote the first two verses in the chorus, thought I was through. And I played what I had of it for a guy that I worked with at the radio station. And he just, it just n- nailed him. He got out a pencil and started writing what we turned into the third verse, which gives you hope, the song hope that maybe something's going to turn around uh, somewhere down the road in this relationship. So uh, that's that's the way we wrote it, and we pitched it all around town. Uh, that and backside of thirty, I did in the first demo session I ever did in town, full demo. I, I did a, a lot of my demos, guitar voice in the production room at the radio station oh, yeah. at midnight when nobody else was around. But the first production uh, demo I did was Rose and Backside. They were pitched all over town. Backside of thirty was actually cut by Joe Stampley before I had my deal. And he wanted it to be a single, but they wouldn't let him. And uh, so, you know, but everybody turned down the songs, everybody in town. Chet Atkins came to me. We were doing a TV thing together uh, out at the Opry House. He said, you know, John, if if if, you, if I'd have heard you, I don't know that I would have signed you. I said, well, you did hear me, and you didn't <laughs> sign me. <laughs> <laughs> He said, I, he said, but so he did hear, he did hear both of those songs and me, but he, he, he disappeared from the room and he came back a little while with a photographer. He said, I want to take a picture with you. I said, you got it, sir. Uh, anyway, uh, funny things that happened along the way, but everybody in town heard those songs, but uh, Jim Fogel song, he, he's the one that, uh, that 
said, okay, well, let's take a chance on it. You let's know, see what happens. Well, where Waltz is as difficult as I can imagine back then, that some uh, waltzes don't land well with everybody. I know. You well, know? it's and that is so sad because some of the greatest songs ever done have been waltzes. Yes. And uh, they, they've got soul. I don't understand why, you know, there's such a negative thing about them. Uh, again, it's probably because everybody wants to jump up and down dancing and all that stuff. I don't know. I don't know what it is. It doesn't make any sense to me. But uh, thank God, uh, it well, wasn't both that of the ones you just named. Were yeah, 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 exactly. And several of my songs are waltzes, and uh, that's another reason I probably wouldn't be happy doing it today the way they're doing it. I, they wouldn't let me. If they're not going to let me do it the way I want to do it, then I ain't going to do Amen. it. Amen. <laughs> and, there, you know, there's there's something about you've got to sing the waltz with a, with a lot of soul. Right. Especially a slick waltz that's got a lilt to it. The boom, chink, chink, that, not that. That's yeah, not yeah. what I'm talking about. Right. The slick, moving, fluid right. waltzes. You've got to sing that almost bluesy. Yeah. Like you did, or it doesn't translate right. And everybody everybody just doesn't get that part of a waltz. They, I understand. Special, they don't feel it. They yeah. don't feel it, and you really got to feel it. Yeah. What a great song. Big old classic record for John Conley. Top five all the way back in 19. 1978. Here's Rose Colored Glasses. In the studio with John Conley. So, uh, what uh, I know you were telling me a while ago that you've got a gospel album that you're finishing up. Do you right. have a working title for it? No. Uh, in fact, I don't even know. We've got about probably 20 or 21 uh, possible tracks on it. And if it was up to me, and it, it, it ultimately will be because I got my own label. But uh, we'll probably put the whole thing out or we could split it up. It just depends on, you know, how things go. But I'm excited about it, and I'm looking forward to getting it out there. It's a combination of some older songs, a Gaither, a couple of Gaither songs in, yep. in the mix, and and some newer songs that we've covered that have been hits for other people and so forth. But again, they they are songs that meet the criteria of melody and message. And uh, you're out touring. You're doing about 60 days a year. Right. Your website? johnconnelly.com easy enough we spell connelly c o n l e e not l e y you really gosh you just have such a great voice i mean i, I hate harping on that cuz we've talked about how you were in, on the radio for so many years but you still got it you can well, still pick you. up a mic today and do it i appreciate it do you it. ever fill in a little bit i think maybe i have a time or two uh, a little bit I, i've done cody's show a couple times back you know when I he's been i come you never out. hosted the opry i don't ever see you doing that when i'm there well, I don't know. They, if you're over <laughs> 40, you, you can't be on TV. <laughs> well, they, they won't even induct you if you're over 50. Yeah. Oh, well, you see that? Yeah, Poor well, Tracy. Yeah, it's yeah. All good. yeah, I got you. what it is. Life in the fast lane. There you go. You know, it's a pleasure. I've always been a fan, and I've Thank really you, been looking forward to sitting down and visiting with you. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been I a have. pleasure getting to know you a little bit. Same here. Thank you for the body of work. Thank you for the influence that you are and the man that you are. It's Thank pleasure. you, sir. Mr. John Conley. Y'all know the deal between now and this time next week. Y'all keep her between the ditches. Yeah, they'll go. Honky-tonkin', honky-tonkin'.